Uh, I am Jen Lucas, and today I am going to talk to you about 20 different ways that we can sort of sort of radicalize our ways that we work together. Um, radicalize as in be radical. Um, but before I get there, I feel like I would miss an opportunity if I did not take this chance to tell you a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so my friends, why don't the seagulls live by the bay? Because then they'd be bagels. Yeah! Achievement unlocked, thank you. <laughs> Can't wait to tell my mom about this. Anywho, so going back to why we're here, to talk about 20 things that we can do to be better coworkers. So I want to tell you that some of the things I'm going to talk about today, we might not agree on. <laughs> Some might be things that you're totally already doing. Some might be things that I will tell you and you'll be like, that's not a very smart idea, I'm not going to do that. Some of it just might seem silly, but it's all totally possible. So if they are things that you wanna integrate into your workflow, hopefully you will take some of these home. So, rule number one, let's get very, very serious. We have to be professional. Actually, I'm sorry, could you all excuse me just for like, just like one minute, just one minute, I'll be right, I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't have time to get this drink before we started. How does that make you feel when I say that, right? I'm guessing not great. What if I said to you, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it here on time for my talk, there was traffic. Or, I had to take a call. What about, sorry, I was locked in my house, just, just couldn't make it here. <laughs> oh, I thought you said I was on at 5.30, so technically I'm early right now, right? My kid was sick, it's me, so it would probably be my cat was sick, right? Think about how these lines make you feel when I say them to you. Have you ever waited for someone at a meeting and instead of them being on time, they came in and said something like one of these? Have any of you ever said something like one of these? Yeah. <laughs> Have any of you ever said something like one of these more than 10 times? Right? And if you're in the latter camp, I will say to you that really rule number one is to be professional, we have to be on time. When I left the stage for one minute, no big deal, right? In my head, it's just one minute of time that was passed. But when there's 150 people waiting for you, all of a sudden that one minute is 150 minutes. That's two and a half hours of lost time. You know, when you're late to a meeting, if it's five minutes, but there's 10 people waiting for you, that's 50 minutes. Now, of course, this isn't black and white, right? This isn't like, a, oh, you know, there's one right answer to this. But we have to think about how these sort of excuses sound to other people. You might have to, had to, like, you might have to take a call, but what I hear is that it wasn't important enough for you to get in time to the meeting that I wanted to talk to you about things. Or there was traffic, well, maybe that means we have to account for that and leave earlier. I had to grab coffee means I'm putting my needs before others. And it's not that people don't have good excuses, right? Life happens, you know, your kid's sick, your cat's sick. These are like, these are things that need attention. We have to pay attention to them. There's always going to be things that we just can't plan for. Life gets crazy. And so instead I will say to you that really rule number one is be on time most of the time. Because as long as you're on time most of the time, then people will gain trust in your commitment and professionalism. If you're not a chronically late person, the times when life does happen, people won't think you're taking advantage of them. Your coworkers will trust you. And trust is such an important aspect to being someone we want to work with. And we gain trust, of course, by embracing transparency. Right? We have to be honest with our clients and our coworkers. 
email if you're going to be late to that meeting, right? An email before the meeting starts, not after, of course, right? If you see your mornings going awry and there's a chance that you might be late, just go ahead and email and plan for the worst. And then if you happen to show up on time, great. But otherwise, people are expecting this and not waiting for you. What we also have to keep in mind, though, is that we don't want to be overly transparent, right? If you're a trustable person, most likely your coworkers won't need to know the excuses of why you're late. Not only will they not need to know, they probably don't want to know. Here's an email that I once received. Hey guys, because the school's closed, Shaq's daycare is also closed. The kid was not really named Shaq, I just, it's like my fictional go-to name for some reason. Judy and I are splitting the day, so I'll be in, around, or before lunchtime. I'll be responding to or creating as many bugs as I can while Shaq watches some game shows. Don't hesitate to call or IM or email. I'll have my laptop in front of me all morning unless I'm changing a diaper, of course. Now, I don't need to know all this, right? I always talk to my friend Sarah Walker Betcher, who's an editor at a list apart. She always says, you can cut like 75% of everything you write, right? So what I really need to know is this, right? Hey, I'll be in around lunchtime, responding to or creating. Don't hesitate to call or IM or email. Right? And not to say that short's necessarily better either. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't need to feel like paint's more important. Just say you're going to be in at 11, and then I'm none the wiser, you know? And it's not to say you have to be completely stark of personality either, but it's all about finding that right balance and the right amount of transparency. And so speaking of emails and writing, we also need to know how to write genuinely to each other. We need to balance a line of when to be professional and casual in these situations. So here is a piece of feedback on a pull request. Do not decline your own pull request that you're going to update. I'm not sure why you would do this as we lose all visual of the updates you just made. Just update any changes and recommit to the same branch. Seems OK, straight, straightforward, right? A little bit blunt. But sometimes this can be a little harsh, especially remember we're communicating and we're, someone's reading this. I'm not going to talk to you like, hey, you know, don't decline your own pull request. You're just going to update it. People are reading this and sometimes they can take this very personally. One of the things that can really help is using contractions. So instead of do not, don't. It softens up your language. Also, starting a message with firm instructions like this can be really harsh. Other thing is try to avoid the word just. Just sort of implies that there's really not much effort involved in changing this, where many people there can be effort involved. You know, start off with something lighter, a little bit of a why for a request. And it always really helps to include the word please, a very, very underrated word. When you're starting to write introductory emails, it's also really important to think about what you say. You know, hey, I used to work for Happy Cog, and this was a letter we got. Um, hey, Coggers, I hear you're looking for a stand-up front-end guy in Austin. I'm that guy. I breathe code, ask my poor wife, and have recently been looking for a proper home with cool projects that keep me hungry. Now, I was the director of front-end development and in charge of hiring at this point, and I will tell you right away that I was not specifically looking for a guy, and I was also not looking for marriage jokes in introductory emails. You know, we just have to be a little bit careful about this line of casualness that we're putting here. Hello, I'm a front-end web, web end engineer. I live in Salt Lake City and wanting to relocate my family to Austin. Do you have any positions available for my skill set? Also, make sure you're doing homework before you cold call and email people, right? We always have to put in the effort for this. If you're the instigator of communication, do your homework and research before you reach out to people. You know, The feedback I would have had for this person was that feedback is one word. Um, but again, I just went ahead <laughs> and waited and kept that to myself. And I'm not saying this is easy, right? Putting this in, it's, it's really hard work. But the thing is, you can tell when people are just faking it, right? <laughs> like, did you even, did she even try on this email? Did you get a little bit of spell check in there? Like, I, I know it's hard. Spell check doesn't pick up everything, but come on. A little bit of effort, long way, right? Remember, this is how we're starting our future relationships with the people that we work with. <sighs> Speaking of impressions. Fashion mate is something that we can often overlook when it comes to our professional situations, right? But what we wear to conferences, work-related events, interviews are really important. You know, do research about what a company is like. I've had people that have shown up in ripped jeans and t-shirts and people that have shown up in suits for interviews and neither one fit the culture and both affected hiring decisions. 
Also figure out what you're going to wear to stakeholder meetings or to client meetings. You know, I used to ask uh, if I should cover my tattoos when I'd go to client meetings. Now, of course, instinctively, I want to be like, you know, if you don't like my tattoos, right? Your problem. <laughs> But the thing is that that's true on my time. There's times when we have to consider things like this. Uh, when I had client meetings with the Holocaust Museum, I would dress differently than when I had client meetings with MTV. People have varying opinions, and respecting that in a professional setting can really help set the precedence for our working relationships. Also about fashion. Oh, man. I have seen so many people drop donuts on themselves before client meetings. It's, it's uncanny, right? So always pack a backup outfit or at least a stain stick. Um, I know someone who uh, takes off their shirt before they brush their teeth in the morning because, you know, how is it that that glob of toothpaste always ends up right on your shirt, right? What is the deal with toothpaste? <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Uh, one time I was traveling for a client meeting, and I, I had my outfit. And um, I just do not care for ironing, right? Ironing is like the worst. So I do that thing where you like hang your outfit in the shower, and you'll be like, steam will take care of that, right? Yeah, professional. Um, and so I hang it on the little the rod, and I'm like, OK, cool. I turn on the shower, and I turn it back around, and I didn't realize that the shower like head was faced right at the wall instead of down. And my, there's my dress, soaked. And I was like, this is terrible. Had a backup outfit, though, because I'm clumsy and spill stuff on myself all the time. So you know, I was ready. Be prepared. We also, besides fashion, we have to be mindful of our language in professional settings. How many of you have HR at your jobs? It's like a mix, right? It's, it's an interesting field that we have in here. I ask a lot of people. Um, usually, I get like a 50% answer on this, right? Lots of tech companies don't have HR. And so in those situations, it's really up to us to self-censor and consider the feelings of others. How many of you have ever felt uncomfortable at work because of something someone said? It stinks. You know, but it's, it's hard. We have to be mindful of our words. You know, not everyone loves cussing. It's just, you know, it, but it's not just that. It, it goes beyond that, too. There's subtle language choices that we make that can make people very uncomfortable. <sighs> Calling coworkers girls instead of women is something that can really alienate those around you. Also, we have to stop calling interfaces sexy. <sighs> I, I was talking again with my friend Sarah about this, and she was telling me about this tweet someone said where, if you're ever confused about this, try replacing the word sexy with the er word erotic, and then see if you would still call the homepage that, right? <laughs> right? And so you play this thesaurus game. If you're ever unclear about what language to use, would you ever describe an interface as one of these, right? You got and it's tough, because we don't think about these things. But once you start thesaurusing it, you start like really thinking, like, oh, is that actually the word I want to use for this? Maybe, maybe, maybe slick is a better word. Maybe that's the word we're looking for on this. You know, it's tough. You know, they, these things aren't easy. Another thing that is really important is never I, always we. When discussing your team's work, it's never like, oh, I wrote the code for this. I made sure it got shipped on time. We wrote the code for this. We launched this website. It shows a lot about how you work together as a team. Especially in interviewing processes, too. That's something I would always look for, whether someone would describe their work as I or we. We're, we're all working on these projects together. We also want to be careful about keeping personal business out of the office. And I totally, I can't lie. There's other things besides work, right? And how annoying is it that you have to make phone calls to everyone before 5? Like, if every like, doctor and dentist had an email, it would make life a lot easier. So I know these things happen. But just step outside to make the phone call. Your coworkers don't want to hear about your divorce or the weird thing that's on your arm or how much you hate AT&T while you're cursing them on hold, right? These are the things that make, can make workplaces really awkward. But that's not to say that you shouldn't really know your coworkers. So I will rephrase that and say, dedicate the actual time to share personal business with those around you. Your coworkers are people you see probably a lot or almost every day. And the more we like each other, the better we're going to work together. But spend time to develop those relationships. Go out to coffee. Go out to lunch. Actually have a meaningful conversation versus just like, oh, you know, I 
heard you're going to Hawaii because you were on the phone with, you know, US Air. You know, get, get those out in a nice, really, in a, in a great way, you know? Ah, number seven is important. I, uh, I mentioned a side project I was working on recently and, uh, to, or to someone I was working with. And I, they were sort of new, and I told them, like, oh, I'm not familiar with, like, this person that I was working with. And actually, the next day, they'd asked me to go to lunch with them. And I didn't know this person very well. So again, like we saw on the slide before, I was like, yeah, sure, let's, let's get to know each other more. So we go to get lunch, and we sit down. And the first topic of conversation, he says to me, oh, turns out I do know Shaq. Again, <laughs> Shaq actually worked at my old company as, like, a consultant. Shaq was terrible. We fired him. I was like, okay, how about them Phillies? <laughs> like, where do you go with that, right? In this situation, who, who is the person you have negative thoughts about? The fired person or the person telling this person's business of something that happened in the past, right? What it comes down to is this. We want to work with nice people who are nice to each other, right? It's so important. It's so easy and so important. Now, of course, we're going to make mistakes. This is going to happen. We're going to say things that maybe we regret sometimes. I, you know, I still am trying to not say guys or not say man, and I find myself doing that a lot. There are things that are going to slip. Sometimes there's going to be stories you tell that you're like, ah, I wish I hadn't told that one. When that happens, apologize. Right? Sometimes we can go over the line. Address it instantly and sincerely. And this is a way to sort of clear the air. That said, if you have a problem with someone that you work with, it's really important that we find a way to tell them about it. I asked some people what's some, one of the worst things a coworker can do, and I found that most people found what they really want is for you to be direct with them, right? Find a way to talk directly to this person. Now, of course, this will not work if you feel unsafe in a situation. In that case, of course, go right to your manager or someone else to help uh, solve this, the problem. But if it's something like, you know, your coworkers writing really like terse feedback or like vaping at their desk. <laughs> you know, just to just tell them, send them a little message. Be like, you know what, actually I'm not really, I'm not really a fan of what's happening right here. Could you maybe do that someplace else, right? Find a way to tell them because you know it's possible they have no clue. I'm sure my friend and I used to, when we worked together, we used to thing, we'd be like, can you tell me if I'm like doing anything like weird with like my face, right? Because like you don't know sometimes. So finding a way to be open with people. Oh, always meet your deadlines, right? Sometimes this means under committing and over delivering, right? Always be dependable. You want to be someone that people can rely on. And sometimes this means that we have to know when to ask for help. If you have a deadline approaching and you're not going to make it, let your boss or coworkers or both know as soon as possible, right? So you all can plan for it together. It's so weird. Some of us, we work elbow to elbow with each other, but we're sort of scared or hesitant to ask each other for help. It could be for a lot of reasons, right? Maybe some of us are perfectionists and don't want people to know that we need help. Maybe it's something where your coworker is really busy, so you don't want to bother them. Or maybe it's because there's so many good resources out there on the internet that we don't think we're like, oh, we can find it somewhere else, or, you know, or I should know this. Right? And of course, there is a lot of information out there. And you should be seeing what's out there before asking your coworkers for help. Right? It's like the, the let me Google that for you syndrome. Right? If you're looking up a CSS property, that's something you can Google. But we don't want to be scared to ask for help. If we want to meet deadlines, we have to feel comfortable working, uh, working with each other and learning from each other. What I like to do is I use the 15 minute rule. So if you can't figure it out after 15 minutes, ask for help. What this does is it shows self-initiative to try to solve the problem while also respecting your coworker's time and then also respecting your team and trying to complete a project together. I like this because I love formulas, so this is really easy for me to be like, okay, here's my time limit on this. If you want to challenge yourself or move up in your job roles, it's really important that we're taking the initiative to self-teach beyond what our job requirements are calling from us. Now, when I talk about being a good coworker, a lot of that has to do with embracing what we do as our career. Many of us are in the web field because it's something that we love. How many of you love being in this field? Right? 
Sometimes we have to remind ourselves how cool it is, the things that we're doing, right? And how we should never be complacent and always strive to improve. Part of that is embracing feedback. Now, let's be honest, feedback is tough, right? No one wants to be told what they're doing wrong. It's not like you're like, hey, what are you doing? It's Friday night. Ah, I was hoping someone would give me some feedback on how my talk went if they didn't like it. <laughs> you know, like you have to sort of balance this. But instead, let's try to spin it. And instead of looking at feedback as negative, let's look at it as opportunity. Opportunity for us to grow and get better at what we love, right? I just saw your, you raise your hand, so I know that we all want to get better at this. In the end, it will make you better at what you do. Also, if you really want to get great at this, we have to make sure that we're going beyond our work hours. Tackling a website from start to finish is a great way to do this, and you can do that with a personal project. How many of you have ever gone home in the evening, maybe after being at a bar, maybe just having a very inspiring day, and you're like, I've got an idea. I'm, and then you go and you register that domain, and you're like, this is going to be brilliant. Yeah? How many of you own a lot of those domains, right? How many of you have those domains and you haven't done anything with them yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, but these are great ways. Like These are the projects that we could be learning on, right? I had one of these ideas. I had one of these ideas where I thought it would be a good idea to have a show where you just cooked recipes for the sides of boxes. <laughs> I believe I was with Chris at that time when I thought of that idea. And I was like, because there, there was a recipe on the side of a vanilla wafer box. Like, talk about something that doesn't need a recipe, right? You're just like, reach in, consume. Um, but it did. Um, so my friend also thought this was a brilliant idea. So we went ahead and we made this project. And doing a project like this, let me go through so many different phases, right? So concepting, script writing, video editing, user experience, design. That was, that was fun. Uh, development, you know, project management. I think we often forget about project management, but it's a super important skill to have. Managing ourselves both solo and in a team can help us all work better together. We can also learn more through collaboration. You know, we all know how hard it is to stay up to date with everything in the tech field. To be a jack of all trades, right? Lots of times it can be lead to being a master of only a couple, but it's important to be well-rounded and be knowledgeable outside of our specialty. Okay, warning, we are now entering the job role stereo portion, stereotype portion of this talk. Here we go. Designers in the room. How many of you have ever reviewed a comp and it was made in the browser, and you had designed it wonderfully on a grid, and all of a sudden, there's no grid in sight when your developer shows it to you. And the developer says, <laughs> right? Developers in the room. How many of you received a comp, and it's got like a design element, or 50, and you're like, well, we could build this if like the CSS 27 spec was out, right? <laughs> And when you express your concerns, you're greeted with <sighs> product managers, right? Ever try to compose a project timeline and then when you show it to your team, like, that's way too short. And the client's like, that's way too long, right? Exchanges like this are why it's so important that we have to be on the same page as our team. tough sometimes, very tough. That's why we have coworkers to support us. But if we respect each other, we work better together. Um, but how do we do that if we don't want, know what it's like to be in each other's shoes, right? Which can be weird and uncomfortable, <laughs> but a necessity, right, of getting better at our jobs and working well together. We gain respect for the people that we work with by understanding what they do. Otherwise, it's really common for us to make assumptions about you know, how hard or easy or silly some of the people that we work with, what they do for their jobs. We become more well-rounded when we learn about the team and all aspects of web design and development. And one of the other ways we can do this is by sharing. 
Writing, teaching, and speaking don't just help those around you expand their horizons, but it also helps you solidify your knowledge on a subject. Organize weeklies, bi-weeklies, monthly lunch and learns with your teams. And they can be about anything, right? They can be introductions to Git. They can be about Gantt charts. They can be about infographics. They can be about how to use Basecamp or set up a grid in Photoshop. It can be about so many things, but the idea is you share with each other and you rotate through everyone giving presentations at lunch to sort of share team knowledge. But how do you get people to go to this? That's right, my friends, pizza. Seriously, though, pizza is like the magical tool for team collaboration. <laughs> if you provide pizza, they will come, right? It's like if it's there, people will show up to meetings like magic. It's wonderful. Beyond that, attend local meetups with your team, right? Learning together is a great way to build team sort of, you know, collaboration and team building. Or teach together. Create a panel with your coworkers and submit it to one of your local meetup groups. If there isn't something local there already, start one with your coworkers. Also, volunte uh, volunteering is a great way, and organize maybe a coworker volunteering session where you all go and TA at the same group or teach together. You know, there's great organizations that are teaching a, a lot of underrepresented groups amazing things these days that could always use volunteers. Also, as a team, we want to make sure that we're working on documentation together. So style guides, pattern libraries, coding standards, you know, even contracts and timelines. These are documents that we can be working on together. You sort of divvy things up and then work on them and review them in pieces. So uh, recently uh, at a job where I'm consulting, I started an image optimization doc, or sort of an image best practice doc, and I split up each section for people on the team. So someone handled optimization, someone handled uh, the picture element, people are handling things like cropping, scene seven, all these different parts. And what happens is when you split up that work together, people become more invested. They become more invested in your documentation and the standards that you're setting together as a team because now you're all involved and you're all making these decisions together. Also, it's great because it's really nice to see what other people have to say about things, which is really nice so you learn as well. Another thing I really like to do is learn something new. So learn something completely different. I've taken jewelry classes, sewing classes, woodworking classes, bowl turning classes. Pole turning is the worst. <laughs> um, but what learning something new does is it teaches us about empathy. And it reminds us what it's like to not understand something as much as we do right now. It can also remind us how cool it is, the job that we have. Remembering how hard it is to learn something really re can tell us what we're sort of taking for granted about our own jobs. When we learn new things, we become more patient with others. So when com someone comes up to you and asks for help, sometimes you can be like, oh, don't you know this already? And learning something new remembers, oh yes, there was a time when we all didn't know that the things that we know now. It reminds us to sort of take this patience with your coworkers. Patients can help us work better together and remember that we all might have different working styles. Not all of us prefer to work the same way. When I asked people about what the best thing a coworker can do, I got a variety of different answers. And then on the opposite spectrum, They're very different distinct types of criteria that people think make a good coworker. And that's because we have different working styles. Often animosity at work can come from not understanding the personality types of the people that we're working with. Something I really like in the, is the asker versus guesser sort of philosophy. So in ask culture, the idea is that askers have the expectation that it's okay to ask for anything, but they're also okay with receiving no as an answer. Whereas guessers avoid putting requests out until they're pretty sure the answer will be yes. So for example, your friend is coming to town and they send you an email. And they say, hey, I'm going to be in your town. Can I stay with you for two weeks? Now, an asker will say, well, if I don't ask, how will ever I know? And a guesser can say, well, that's rude of you to ask to be there for two weeks. All right? So a boss may say, hey, you know, can you work on this tonight? And guessers might hear that as a request or sort of a demand that they have to work on it. But your boss may be an asker and totally okay with you saying no. 
When we think about these things, we sort of understand where people are coming from. So guessers may find askers impolite by being rude, whereas askers may find guessers impolite by being passive aggressive. If we understand how people are, it makes it easier to work together, right? It makes it easier to empathize and adjust your request according to the needs and the personality types of the people that you're working with. It's also really important to establish team norms. Uh, I've worked with a fabulous scrum master, Annalise, and um, she loved team norms, and it was really great some of the ways that uh, they were implemented into the teams when I worked uh, with her. What you want to do is sit down with your team, right? And write down what each team member thinks is a great aspect to working together. It can be in the environment, it can be in communication, it could be anything. It could be like, always schedule meetings for 25 minutes so you can make it to the other meeting. You know, the 25-55 rule so you always have time to get to the next meeting. Or it can be like something like, if headphones are on, that means it's heads down work, slacker I am me. You know? Or it can be something like, we only check emails at 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. Or you know, no offensive jokes are allowed in the office. Or we should always celebrate team milestones with pizza or just with high fives at whenever we launch something. The team norms can be anything that works for you and your team. But after you make them, you then review the list together and sort of come up with these norms and establish them as rules for your team and revisit often. You can learn a lot when you sort of write these down on post-it notes and review them with each other. Some things you may, maybe never knew about your coworkers, things that help them work better and then you will work better in turn together. Number 19. <laughs> Number 20. <laughs> so the last rule. We have to say thank you. People who show gratitude in the workplace increase their productivity and happiness by as much as 31%. Yet, less than 15% of us express thanks in the workplace. There is a devastating amount of hate in this country. We need to appreciate each other more, and we need to show that appreciation. I want to thank Nicole and Adam right now for organizing CSS Conf. I really cannot express to you how happy I am to be a part of this. This has been, I think, the most inclusive conference I have ever attended, and the effort that you have put in to establish this has been great. I have loved being here for two days, and I have loved learning with all of you, and I will just thank you so much for putting this together and putting so much effort and being proactive in this, so thank you very much for this. And now I want everyone else to take a moment, and I want you to think about the people that you work with. And I want you to think about something awesome that they do. And it can be anything. It can be they, you know, they brought you a snack when you were working late, or they helped you work through a bug, you know, or they left you alone when you have headphones on. It can be any one of these things. It can be big, it can be small. But whatever it is, when you get back to work on Monday or this weekend or whenever your schedule allows you to work, because, man, we have a great feel, but lots, a lot of us have flexible schedules, right? I want you to buy them a cup of coffee or a donut or send them an email if you don't work with them in the office, right? Or look them in the eyes and just say thank you. Say thank you for everything you do. Because it really, the stuff that we work on together, it's super awesome. The stories I've heard from all of you, it's been so great. This field is awesome and we have this awesome community and we really need to appreciate that because it's awesome and we really are all in this together. So thank you sincerely.